Hey everyone, today we're going to learn about what XAPI is, get a high level overview, and start thinking about how you can start using it in some of your projects. All right, let's go ahead and just quickly cover what XAPI is and how you can start using it and just get a brief overview, especially if you're completely new to XAPI. You don't know what it is, you've never used it, or anything like that. So let's go ahead and dive in, and first of all, explore some of the differences with XAPI and SCORM. Now, XAPI is a little bit different than SCORM. If you're familiar with SCORM, SCORM allows you to track some simple things, like getting started with a project, if you launch a course. It also allows you to track if it's in progress and where it's in progress as well. It will track like completion, if the learner has completed a course or not completed a course. And then it will track quiz and quiz data. Now it does a little bit more. You can store information. You can also bookmark items as well, meaning bookmark. And so the user can actually resume where they left off and, and things like that. Does that really track all learning? No, there's so much more that you can track. You know, if a person commented or downloaded or tried something out, if they mastered something, if they didn't master something, that's the type of information that to really know how your learners are learning, that's the type of information that you would need to know. So let's cover sending over XAPI statements because XAPI itself really revolves around statements and XAPI statements. And we're gonna cover what those statements are. With these statements, you send over at different events when something happens, when the user clicks on something or when the user downloads something, when they start something, when they complete something. So these are different events that the learner will do. Now, most of the time, you actually have to have it be a digital event. But you could have that be like, you know, somebody downloaded some files to their desktop and they open that up, those files in desktop, or they have an iPad and they go around to different uh, different items or different uh, parts of the museum and they tap on something. Those are different events. Now, those are events that you will want to track. And so you start to have, you have to start to plan, okay, what do I want to track? Do I want to track when the learner, you know, taps on something in a museum? Do I want to track when they completed a video? Do I want to track, you know, where they paused in the video if they did pause? Things like that. So that's that's the part that you have to map out and the part that you have to do before you get started with this. Now, what happens with those events? So when those events fire, or when the events happen, what do I do with the events? And so usually you have to capture the, the person, you have to know who it is and so forth. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But then the last part of it is really storing that event into some type of database, which usually is something called a learning record store or an LRS. So in this example, a learner goes and pulls up their mobile phone and then they interact with something on their mobile phone. So they tap on something. And so that tap is this event that then triggers this function or this, you know, what is going to happen. This function is listening for something. As soon as it hears the events, it captures the events and it captures who the person is that actually did the events. What action did they do? Did they tap on it? Did they complete a video? Did they uh, download something or anything like that? It captures the action. And then it describes the action. What action did they do and why did they do it and what's the description of that action? And so that's really the kind of information that you would put here. So you'd have like Jeff downloaded a PDF or what PDF it was. That's the description. Now you can provide other details like results. Did they pass a quiz? Did they uh, do other some type of metadata? You can add that as an optional item as well. Now it creates this record. Now this record is usually in a format called JSON. And so it basically creates this record. And then that record gets sent over to this learning record store, which is a database. This database is essentially waiting for these different statements to come in. So as this statement gets sent over to this learning record store, it then stores that record inside of this LRS and it keeps it and it now becomes part of the learner's history. Now, one of the challenges with SCORM is it really did not allow you to transfer information from one system to another system easily. It took a lot of migration. It took a lot of effort to be able to do that. 
But LRSs and learning record stores allow you to actually transfer those records pretty easily. So it's it's not it's more flexible and it allows the learner to to take a history of what they've done in one organization and transfer over to a different organization. So just keep in mind that the LRS is this kind of record of what's happening. Now, the different events could be something like touch, or they could be a click, or they could be a shake if the user shakes the device. It could be when the media starts or when the media completes, and that could be audio or video. It could also be when the media reaches a certain point. So it gives you all this information and allows you to track more detail. I think a lot of the times we spend a lot of budget creating a video but we don't know how effective it is. We just put it as, you know, page number two, watch a video, but did they really watch the video or did they jump onto the next page or did they pause at a certain point? What point did they pause at? Those are the kind of things that would help you create better learning. And if you know that information, you can improve that video or improve future courses. So learning record stores essentially allow you to store this information. And this record is in a format called JSON or JSON, or I've heard it both ways essentially, but essentially there's this learning record and it starts to store all this information inside of this learning record store. So inside of the learning record store, it has the statements that describe who, what action they did, and what is the description. And then it starts to essentially show this feed of statements that come through and you can see like who the person is, what action did they do, and the description of that action. Now on each of these statements, you can click on those statements and get more information, more metadata, the timestamps, exactly what time did they do it, um, and so forth. So, But the key here is knowing who the person is, what action did they do, and then describing that action. When you send over statements, you need to know who the learner is, you need to track what action did they do, and then you need to describe that action. Now, there's a lot of different verbs out there. You can track attended, asked, imported, resumed, launched, exited, failed, mastered, and so there's a lot of possibilities here. Now, one of the biggest benefits to XAPI that I don't think we explore enough is not only can you track this information, but you can use that information for future courses. So when somebody launches a course, you can actually go ask the LRS, did they do this? How long ago did they do this? Uh, what was their score when they did this? And based on the information that comes back to you, you can send them down different paths. So you can say go, they go down path number one, or they view video number two, which is a shorter video. So you can make all those decisions and personalize content so the learner gets a different experience and it's personalized to them. Now, if you want to see all the verbs, you can check out this URL and this will give you a list of all the verbs available for you. So a learning record store ranges in a lot of different possibilities. Now, there are some free re learning record stores. There are some ones that will just give you the information that you can test it out. My favorite is cloud.scorm.com that I can just track the information and just make sure that it's working. But some learning record stores will give you a lot more reports like Watershed or Yet Analytics or Learning Locker. Now, Learning Locker can be free as well where you can install it yourself. So if you wanted to install it yourself, you can use Learning Locker uh, and use that on your own servers. Or you can use something like Watershed and Yet Analytics where they host it for you and you get all this additional graphics, uh, reports, other things like that, that you can just go in and you can tie these different statements together and you can create these general reports for you. Now, to create these statements, it does take some JSON, but if you've never actually built JSON, this is a great tool for you to use to say, okay, what verb am I wanting to use? What action uh, am I wanting them to do? How am I going to describe that as well? So check out this tool to, to see how this statement builder works and you can get that statement and just copy that code when you start to send over your statement. In future videos, we're going to cover how to send over your first statement, but this is just an overview. Now, I wanna dive into one example. So there's a lot of different possibilities that you can choose from, but I want to dive into one example of how you can start using XAPI to track video. So when we're talking about video, like the example that I said before, we may take a lot of time and effort to produce a video, and then usually we put it inside of an e-learning course, but we don't know how effective that video was. 
So thinking about the video itself and thinking about the different events that come with the video, let's walk through where we can actually track X API. So in a video, when you start to play the video, so the user goes and they click on play, that's an event. That's something that we can capture. That event is a play event, and we can then say, hey, that event is going to create this X API record and then send that X API record over to the learning record store. Now we have a record that the learner has actually played or initialized the video, and it's basically stored inside of that learning record store. So as the video starts to play, the learner may pause the video and say, hey, I need to pause it for a second. Well, that's another event. So as soon as that event happens, which is a pause event, you can then send over an X API statement that says, hey, they paused the video. And you can even capture some information about the video and know exactly where they were inside of the video as well. So as they play more, and let's say they reach halfway in the video, that could be another event. As the timeline starts to update, that's a video event. And so it will create this, you know, that they reached halfway event. You can send over an X API statement to the learning record store, and now you have record of that as well. Now, when the video completes, it's another event of finish, and it will send over this statement in the learning record store and have that inside of the learning record store. Now you can set this up custom or you can use some of the events available from Learning Dojo. I'm gonna go there right now and I'm gonna come in and go to the template section and you can see here we have a lot of different templates. We have templates for local video, we have templates for Vimeo, we have templates for YouTube as well as interactive which we'll talk about in a future video as well and then templates for you to track storyline X API events as well. Now I'm going to come into the X API verbs and show you the different types of verbs available. So you can see here as I start to scroll down, there are so many different verbs that you can actually use. Now coming into the statement builder, you can see here as I start to choose the different types of verbs, I can choose what verbs I want to use. I can add a description. I can also come in here and add more context and results and other things like that. And then it creates this statement for me. I can then copy that statement and then paste it inside of my code. And we'll cover how to do that in a future video. Now that's just an overview of X API and what it can do. If you're wanting to learn more, check out my website under Udemy courses and go into X API fundamentals or stay tuned to this channel and we'll have plenty more videos coming out all about X API and other development skills for learning.